Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I am the program manager for Maven Project. Thank you all for joining us today and our friends at Cherokee for hosting today's session on chest pain in children in the office setting with Dr. Gerard Engoff. Dr. Engoff is an assistant clinical professor of pediatrics at Dartmouth Hitch Hitchcock Medical Center in New Hampshire and a consultant in medical information technology. He has had a dual role in patient care and medical informatics and he specializes in pediatric and adult congenital heart disease and is co-director of the Adult Congenital Heart Program. Uh, he guides training implement, implementation and optimization of electronic medical records focusing on efficiency outcomes and quality improvement. And he has served as a consultant for the implementation of EPIC at community health centers in greater Boston. We are very thankful uh, to have Dr. Engoff as one of our Maven Project volunteers. So Dr. Engoff, when you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Kristen. Depending on your time zone, <clears throat> good morning or, 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 uh, or good afternoon. My topic, chest pain in children and, and adolescents, I hope will be a bit provocative and perhaps a, a little uh, less than what you might, or, or a little variant from what you might expect. Uh, usual disclosures, I, I have no uh, conflicts of interest and uh, CME is through the uh, UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine. Okay, well, Kristen gave a little bit of, of an introduction. I'll, I'll make some comments a, a, a little bit about my background and perhaps why I'm talking this morning. <clears throat> the talk will involve some clinical scenarios, I think, to set the, the, the tone and overview. Uh, I will discuss pediatric chest pain as a conundrum, <clears throat> a, a, a bit of a literature review, some key data from three articles that I think are instructive, talk a little bit about diagnosis and treatment, and then a wrap up. I'm a clinical cardiologist, uh, most recently in an academic setting. My training is in both adult and pediatric in cardiology. And in recent years, I've focused clinically on adult congenital heart disease. And Kristen mentioned some of my medical IT consultant work, which is process-based optimization of workflows, looking at quality and outcomes. And you'll probably see a, a bit of that perspective in some of my slides and comments. Okay, uh, two clinical scenarios that uh, I'd like you to kind of think about uh, a, a bit in terms of what you might do or what you might think. <clears throat> the first is a 15 year old young lady, high school student, <clears throat> with chest pain of two weeks duration, who was referred for pediatric cardiology consult. <clears throat> she had had um, an emergency room visit the day after onset, which was two weeks before, and she had a whole lot of tests, <clears throat> basically just about everything <clears throat> that they could think of <clears throat> to include uh, lab tests, CKGs, chest CT scan, was in the emergency room for several hours, and uh, the the cost was seven thousand dollars. And this was a while ago; it would probably be <clears throat> a, a lot more than that. <clears throat> and was discharged home to follow up with a primary care physician, and was told that everything was normal. Uh, <clears throat> at the time of consult, there wasn't a lot of detail about the chest discomfort, and I started in trying to, to find out a little bit more. It was a sharp stabbing pain, <clears throat> seven and 10 intensity, lasting seconds, left upper chest radiating to the shoulder and back. It was both pleuritic and positional, occurring multiple times a day. It was improved with, um, <clears throat> with some uh, NSAID pain medication, uh, um, ibuprofen, um, uh, most most likely. Uh, you starting again a, a bit of an idea. Um, are you thinking is this is this cardiac? Some further history. You really have to 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 delve into it. Often when I see a patient with chest discomfort, 
my thought is not is it not just is it cardiac, but what else could it be? Okay, the day before the onset of the discomfort was the first cheerleader practice of the season. She was a cheer, cheerleader. And she was one of these folks who would toss her teammate up into the air and her pain <coughs> was, uh, when, <coughs> was, was the next day um, felt when she awoke. <coughs> and at the time of her visit, it was almost gone and differed progressively. Uh, <clears throat> cardiac, physical examination, uh, normal oxygen saturation, and she had pain with deep inspiration and she, was, she had tenderness of the left upper chest on firm palpation, which reproduced her symptom. Remember, she's had thousands of dollars of testing. <clears throat> so what was the treatment? Well, as you might have guessed, it was reassurance. <clears throat> uh, mom said, <clears throat> you mean after all of this, it was nothing? <clears throat> Clinical scenario second. A seven-year-old boy, chest pain, shortness of breath, two months duration referred <clears throat> for a consultation. And he had had multiple primary care visits, EKG, chest x-ray, a trial of an inhaler, which didn't help. <clears throat> and he needed more history. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> symptoms in the morning most days, a pressure sensation lasting hours, diffuse, worse with breathing, occurred at rest, improved with exertion, and he felt short of breath. <clears throat> with the symptom when it was occurring at rest. Okay, so what's the rest of the story? He had missed several days from his new school. He had recently changed schools because the family needed to move. Why did they need to move? Their house had burned down. It had burned down two months prior on Christmas Eve. He said when he was asked that he had lost all of his toys and presents in the fire and started to cry. Cardiac symptom, his exam was normal <laughs> and treatment occurred, <clears throat> reassurance and, and specifically a recommendation for some counseling. <clears throat> Mom said, I had no idea. So where are we with pediatric chest pain? It's, in a, it's a conundrum. <clears throat> it's extremely frequent. Frequent complaint in childhood. The symptom creates a high level of concern for both family and providers and results in urgent referrals, emergency room visits, urgent care visits. Cost for evaluation is high, and a cardiac cause of chest pain in children is rare. That is the key thought of this talk. <clears throat> Recall children are not small adults and heart attacks, myocardial infarction with extremely rare exceptions do not occur in children. So uh, what are the possible causes of chest pain? Well, there are cardiac causes. And if you delve into the literature, this is the sort of thing that you'll find. Here are some causes uh, cardiac causes of chest pain. And there are pulmonary causes. And there was what you might find. And lists like these are not helpful. How could you ever exclude <clears throat> each of these, these elements or, or, or even re remember a fraction of And this slide purposefully was, was designed so that you couldn't read it because lists like this are just not helpful. What is helpful is a careful history of chest pain. I actually like to use the word chest discomfort because pain <clears throat> means different things to different people. And we're really after characterizing the symptom of discomfort. <clears throat> History is often sparse. <clears throat> uh, sometimes the only 
referral information is, is, is the two words, chest pain. One has to delve a bit. What are the elements of a good chest discomfort history? Well, certainly <clears throat> onset, duration, and frequency. The character, character is, is, is a, a critical factor. What really is the description of, of what's being sensed? <clears throat> is, it, is it an ache, a heaviness, sharp stabbing pain? It really helps us quite a bit. Intensity, location, radiation, where else is it felt? <clears throat> what makes it worse? What makes it better? Is there a relationship to exertion? Recall in our second scenario, exertion relieved the discomfort rather than made it worse. <clears throat> and are there other related symptoms? <clears throat> it can be an effort to, to, to collect elements like this and be able to express it. Uh, here's an example <clears throat> uh, and see what you think. Acute onset of severe, sharp stabbing, pleuritic pain in the center of the chest without relationship to exertion. Lasting seconds occurring off and on over two days, relieved with ibuprofen and improved with exercise. If you had this history, which is just one sentence, do you think you'd be able to, to, to feel comfortable with saying whether it was cardiac or not? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> History is, is critical. I think if you had <clears throat> this, this history, this description, that you would probably take a breath <clears throat> and, and relax a bit about your concerns. A little bit from the literature <clears throat> to uh, it, it expand on, on this notion that a cardiac cause of chest pain in children is rare. <clears throat> the first is an article from 2011, <clears throat> screening for life-threatening chest pain in children. 3,700 children with chest pain. It was a retrospective study and a cardiac cause was determined in 1%. There were three deaths, but they weren't cardiac. Two suicides, and one spontaneous retropreneal hemorrhage. And no patient discharged <clears throat> from the clinic died as a result of a cardiac condition. This is not the population <clears throat> where there was sudden death. <clears throat> uh, causes were identified for some, not all. The most common was musculoskeletal, uh, chest pain, sometimes called a, a catch syndrome followed by pulmonary and GI of the causes that were identifiable. <clears throat> um, anxiety, psychosocial problems would follow most beyond more than 50% were, were unknown, never really defined despite any efforts. And capturing this little box here in the next slide. Oh, just um, one before that. Um, <clears throat> 19 of the 3,700 patients had intrinsic cardiac disease, 0.5%. <clears throat> and of those clear cardiac conditions, pericarditis and myocarditis <clears throat> were most common. Three had an anomalous coronary artery, a congenital defect, one hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and one a dilated cardiomyopathy out of 3,700 patients. <clears throat> The description of these findings by one co-author was needle in the haystack. <clears throat> On 2013, a study from Children's Hospital on chest pain in children. This was, this was now prospective using what's called a SCAMPS methodology, which was a practice guideline. Here, over a thousand patients, ages seven to 21, <clears throat> two out of the thousand, two percent had chest, point two percent had chest pain due to a cardiac cause. One with pericarditis and one with an anomalous coronary artery. Notably, testing performed outside the guideline recommendations 
demonstrated only incidental findings. Patients returning for persistent symptoms did not have cardiac disease <clears throat> and <clears throat> an assessment uh, of most of this thousand, of these thousands of patients was accomplished and <clears throat> was completed with one outpatient visit. Here were the abnormal results, <clears throat> the abnormal elements looked for in the, in the guideline. In terms of patient history, uh, ele elements that, that, that generated some concern and that were uh, uh, triggers for further evaluation, exertional chest discomfort <clears throat> related to syncope, radiation that suggested a cardiac cause. And these two elements <clears throat> increasing with supine associated with fever <clears throat> were aimed at identifying pericarditis. Family history was in was was part of um, the guideline, <clears throat> particularly sudden death, or cardiomyopathy. Physical examination was far less helpful than a careful history, and elements were aimed at uh, uh, acute illness such as uh, pericarditis and myocarditis, <clears throat> and uh, the. Other elements were actually infrequent in these thousand patients. A non-innocent murmur, uh, just to emphasize, means a, a pathological murmur. If you're good at hearing and listening to that, so-called innocent murmurs are still, still murmurs were not a cause of concern. EKG abnormalities could trigger some concern. To move on, <clears throat> uh, if any of these elements uh, were were present, then an echocardiogram was the next step. And note over here the EKG findings; they weren't just non-specific abnormalities; they were clear defects, deviations in the EKG pattern, LVH, RVH, marked ST segment changes, <clears throat> um, right ventricular strain can be suggested by this S1 Q3. T3 pattern, if, if, if that's in your background, QT prolongation, clear abnormalities. Of those who had echocardiograms, it was a mixed blessing. It did identify the two patients who had abnormalities, the pericarditis and the, and the uh, anomalous coronary artery. <clears throat> uh, the, um, the I uh, was uh, the, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the and the anomalous coronary artery, but a lot of abnormalities were found that were incidental, and this tended to be a um, a distraction. And the huge the predominance of echocardiograms that were done based on those clinical elements were normal. Uh, other cardiac testing was unhelpful uh, and it included stress testing, ambulatory monitoring, um, a, uh, a, a bunch of lab tests. It was these tests when done did not help at all in identifying a cardiac cause. And a follow-up to that study, this was now in 2017, um, a follow-up again, using this, this practice guideline from Children's Hospital, now over 3,000 patients, a cardiac cause was found in 0.25%. And the same uh, um, a, a cardiac uh, findings profile, myocarditis, pericarditis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and one an anomalous coronary artery. And again, those non-cardiac causes uh, of most commonly musculoskeletal, GI, and pulmonary of those causes that were identified. Okay, so um, so uh, taking into account some of this data, what, what do you think some of the 
the the treatments are that that um, that you might consider uh, for someone with chest discomfort, a child <clears throat> who comes in to, to see you with, with chest discomfort uh, or calls on the phone. Um, uh, um, refer to the emergency room, urgent care, um, rule out myocardial infarction. Um, are you thinking about some of those? Um, <clears throat> or, or have you felt that you should steer in that direction before? Start thinking about what, what some of the treatments are that you might, might consider based on what I've presented. Well, the first on my list is nothing <clears throat> because of the overwhelming data from the literature <clears throat> that a cardiac condition is rare. Other conditions, if definable, <clears throat> are not life-threatening. <clears throat> and that the symptom invariably in, in these situations will, will resolve, diminish, go away. Certainly, you could say we're going to watch, observe over time. Time is, is, is particularly helpful. Knowing that you're not dealing with a critical or a life-threatening situation, that observation, continued evaluations, changes in story or history <clears throat> is a great strategy. Uh, reassurance. Uh, uh, to patients presented as part of these scenarios, uh, reassurance was, was a key element to be able to say, I have good news for you. I don't think it is a, a cardiac condition. I don't think there, it's the symptoms that you described are a cause for concern. Um, certainly if it's a musculoskeletal symptom, one could try um, NSAIDs, uh, naproxen, ibuprofen, uh, if it seems to be more pulmonary, a trial of an inhaler might help out. Asthma was, was, was quite common in, in the SCAMPS um, Children's Hospital group of patients as those pulmonary conditions. Even when asthma was in control, chest discomfort seems to be common. Um, trial of antacids, or um, again, if it's if you really steer towards towards double, a, a possible GI cause, knowing the data from from the literature, just kind of steer your history that way. Relaxation techniques, if there's an anxiety component, <clears throat> uh, it's worth talking about anxiety. And, and if the history steers in that way. And relaxation techniques are something to do. And uh, I have various ways of, of suggesting that. I don't call it meditation. Um, I just I describe it as, as a, a technique um, that if that discomfort is occurring, that our, our our patients, our young our young folks can 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 learn. Uh, if necessary, counseling like that like that seven year old who who, who clearly um, had had considerable stress from this family event. <clears throat> the fact that he didn't talk about it was part of his symptom, not part of the of, of the reassurance. <clears throat> Okay, well, what's, what's your ultimate worry? Um, you know, uh, a lot of people talk about unnecessary testing <clears throat> in medicine, and to what extent is that testing unnecessary? If you order a test, um, uh, for whom are you doing the test? Is it for the patient? Is it for 
uh, in the pediatric setting, the family? Uh, is it for you? Uh, does testing reassure or does it compound or perpetuate some of the concern or the anxiety? <laughs> Are you worried that there's a misdiagnosis? Well, I think I showed you that from the literature, <laughs> Of the diagnoses that are found, uh, overwhelmingly, they're not a concern. Worry about malpractice. I, I guess that's an element. I'm not sure for each individual, one of us, that, that, that that's something that we think about first. Uh, sudden cardiac deaths. Um, when a young athlete um, uh, dies suddenly, it makes all the newspapers. It's talked about. Uh, just um, uh, just recently, that uh, young NFL player who had a cardiac arrest uh, during during the game uh, that was the story for you know various forms for for a couple of weeks. Uh, looking at this literature about athletes, this is from uh, a um, an article specifically at looking at at causes of of uh, acute cardiac events in athletes. This goes back to 1986 and the theme in, in subsequent articles uh, is, is essentially identical. A cardiovascular disease in the setting is usually unsuspected during the day. And most athletes who die suddenly have experienced no cardiac symptoms. In other words, we're saying that, that these, uh, these young folks who have chest pain who come into you, to your office are not from this, this group of patients who, who are at risk. And only about 25% of those competitive athletes who die suddenly is an underlying cardiac disease detected or suspected before participation. And rarely is the correct clinical diagnosis made. <clears throat> so yes, we're, we, we'd love to be able to identify those young people who might be at risk in particular uh, in 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 their uh, in their activities, but in particularly sports. <clears throat> um, Dr. Uh, Roger and I actually have given a, a prior talk um, about evaluating young people for, for for clearance to participate in sports. And this statement here is makes that task quite difficult. <clears throat> and those who get, get into trouble with, with athletics who have acute events during athletics <clears throat> are a population that's very hard to identify. And as we've seen from these studies, they are those who show up their office with chest discomfort. Okay, so from this, what, what might we do? What, what conclusions um, might occur? <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, certainly, a cardiac cause of chest pain in children is rare and can be excluded by an outpatient examination. A careful history is essential. In fact, if one were to say what element of, of, of evaluating a young person, in fact, probably adults as well, with, with chest discomfort, if you could do just one part of your evaluation, it should be a, a careful history. <clears throat> There are key elements on history and exam that help, that, that, that might be triggers for further evaluation. But remember, <clears throat> the chances of finding something statistically <clears throat> are low. For a screening, an EKG is, is, is the most worthwhile test for an initial screen. Of the cardiac tests, an echo is best when disease is suspected based on a careful history, and I would add EKG after that. 
But remember, most of those echoes are going to be normal or show some incidental findings, which will be a distraction. Treatments are usually symptomatic and certainly include <clears throat> reassurance uh, as an element if, uh, if not uh, principally. Uh, Bernard Lown is a cardiologist of, of some renown, and he was one of my mentors. And this is one of his statements, uh, a, a, a bit of wisdom from his clinical experience about the skills of, 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 listening, of listening when seeing a patient. And to start here, even at its scientific best, medicine is dependent on the intimate story. For doctors, it's the exhilarating act of discovery. For patients, it identifies a healer. Medicine is ultimately a social discipline. It begins with a unique story from a help, from a fellow human being craving help. Okay, some some questions. Um, I, um, perhaps what I've outlined is is provocative. Perhaps you don't agree with these findings, or have had another experience, uh, or have some reactions. Um, I, I'd uh, love to know what your thoughts are. Some additional questions. We've got a fair amount of time. Uh, maybe you could raise your hands, and Kristen. Maybe you can kind of help uh, Absolutely. steer this part of the session. Of course. I love the chicken crossing the road. <laughs> um, yeah, if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A box or the chat box or use the raise hand feature. I do recommend that when using medications and fancy words. But the first question, what are some findings when you would order an echo? A pediatric echo um, is, is best done in the pediatric cardiology department where the technicians are particularly skilled at looking at subtle defects. When there's a young person um, referred for an echo with, for chest discomfort, hopefully that some element of their, their exam, which is, which is steered in that direction and isn't done just to, to order a test, the technicians will look very carefully for congenital abnormalities. That's what they're they're looking for and are after. Uh, a in, in a young person, uh, a good uh, sonographer, cardiac echo tech can see the origins of the coronary arteries. Uh, that's that's a, a a critical part of an echo for chest discomfort. <clears throat> um, They'll also look carefully uh, at, at, the, at the heart valves and there any congenital abnormalities to the cardiac valves, um, aortic stenosis, uh, uh, pulmonic stenosis, um, ventricular function. Is there evidence for a, um, a prior inflammatory process of myocarditis? Right ventricular function. There are, there's, there's a condition called uh, um, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. That would be uh, a thought among for um, for a um, an echocardiogram study. Uh, looking at a pericardial is there evidence for a pericardial effusion? As the story suggests, an acute inflammatory process and um, and um, and pericarditis. They're not thinking about ischemic heart disease. Uh, um, one, one, one other comment about that. I mentioned a lot of um, incidental findings uh, that 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 uh, that can occur uh, that can can uh, arise on echocardiography that have no relationship to the chest discomfort. One can find a uh, a bicuspid aortic valve without any uh, stenosis. Uh, some of valvular regurgitation um, a, uh, um, that 
can be um, physiologic and, and might be confusing uh, and some other more perhaps exotic things that, that again, might not be related. A bicuspid aortic valve, for instance, has an incidence in the general population of as of uh, many as one in a hundred. Great. Okay. Uh, next question is, any different evaluation recommended if palpitations are a part of the symptoms? <clears throat> Again, history is, is, is most helpful. Um, uh, a, a really good way of, of approaching the story that backs palpitations is, is to ask when it occurs, what's the setting? Are there any triggers? And if you're worried about arrhythmias, the most common arrhythmias in children, um, are true arrhythmias are, are superventricular. And what really is, is helpful for me, a, a key uh, aspect of the story is how does it start and how does it stop? Is onset sudden <clears throat> or incremental? And how does it stop? Does it stop suddenly? that would suggest a true arrhythmia, <clears throat> or does it um, resolve um, progressively or gradually over, <clears throat> over time? The palpitations which sort of fade away are far less likely <clears throat> to be um, a true arrhythmia. The word we use is decremental, because a fast heart would be slow gradually, it's unlikely to be an arrhythmia. Um, if one really suspects that a uh, that with palpitations there's there's a true uh, heart rhythm disturbance, um, a lot of people think about 24 hour monitoring, but there's a good chance that the symptom won't occur during that 24 hours. There are devices that are called event recorders <clears throat> that you can have an individual wear for. Uh, for as, um, uh, as a series of days, uh, a month in duration, so that you can actually get a look at an, an EKG tracing at the time of, uh, of their symptoms. But a careful history is a place to start. Wonderful. Uh, how often does anemia leading to tachycardia or an H. pylori infection contribute to chest pain? Well, I, I'm i sorry, what was the first part of that? Oh. Um, how often does anemia leading to tachycardia or H. Py py pylori infection contribute to chest pain? Um, I, I, anemia would have to be pretty severe before I, I think it would cause a true cardiovascular stress. Um, there's an old, uh, um, um, adage, at least in adults, that um, that that um, you would look for a hemoglobin of, of less than ten grams before the cardiovascular system is really uh, under stress um, and at rest. If somebody has a persistent, a child has a persistent tachycardia, they're sitting in their office and they have a heart rate of one hundred and thirty, and it's just there and it just never changes. I'd think about thyroid disease. That would be one thing to think about. Um, certainly, it would be a severe anemia before you'd start to get a cardiovascular change. In terms of H. pylori, again, I mentioned that in our chest pain series that um, although it wasn't the most common, <clears throat> that a gastrointestinal causes of chest discomfort uh, were uh, relatively high on the list. I take careful history. I definitely would steer in that direction if, if that discomfort um, seems to uh, have a, a GI cause or relationship. Again, delve into the story, but steer in that direction if you think that's the way it's going. Wonderful. Um, how would you work up a new onset murmur noted on a WCC in a primary care setting? A new onset of a murmur? Yes. Uh, murmurs in, in children are in, in their own story. It's, it's another talk and it's, it's one of my fascinations. The first with a murmur, 
in a child who is otherwise well is to be able to feel comfortable and to be able to identify an innocent woman, which has a vibratory characteristic variable, often there on one exam, not on another. Uh, it, it can be uh, absent early in childhood and then appear as a child grows. Uh, innocent murmurs, uh, when their uh, their cause is identified are due to vibration of cardiac structures, you can actually see an echocardiogram. So if you hear a murmur and it has a vibratory or a buzzing sound to it, uh, it's it's an innocent murmur, and it's good to to um, to recognize that, and that innocent murmurs can come and go. And so when there's a new onset of a murmur, um, that's the first thing that 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 I think of. Congenital heart defects, by definition, of present at birth. That's what congenital means, present at birth, <clears throat> and a a murmur related to a congenital heart defect is likely to be evident early in life, and it's unlikely to appear um, in, out of the blue in, 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 in an older child. So uh, again, it's where your clinical skills can come, come in. I'm, I'm most tickled when I have a, a, a day <clears throat> uh, in the office and a series of patients of being able to, to, to to make a good decision to to make a diagnosis from history or 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 even examination to to suspect what is going on with without just jumping to to some uh, some tests. Um, if there is a new appearance of a murmur, are there any symptoms associated with it? If your child is just fine participating in athletics, you know, take a step back and sort of say, well. Is, um, <clears throat> is, uh, um, is 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 this part of the of, of uh, the range of, of of normal? If it really does sound like a pathological murmur, what's a pathological murmur? Well, it doesn't have that vibratory quality. It can be, be uh, it can be harsh if you can recognize an ejection murmur. Or a whole systolic murmur. If your ear is good, if you've had the opportunity to have someone teach you that, to 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 really know that that the sound is um, is is that of you know, cardiac dysfunction or some valve dysfunction, uh, then it's then it's kind of helpful. Um, echocardiography uh, is for murmurs from my perspective, the ultimate test. Um, uh, if, if you, um, and, and in the case of innocent murmurs, it would be more. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, next question, if a child has family history of sudden cardiac death, would you refer to a cardiology for further clearance prior to starting athletics? The sudden cardiac deaths um, it, it needs, again, a, a little more history. Is it a first degree relative? Um, is it, you know, is it an uncle um, who was 75 years old? Um, it, to, to get some further detail and background. Um, and if it's in a first degree relative who's relatively young, uh, referral to cardiologists can certainly be appropriate. Uh, if, uh, take an EKG and look at the corrected QT, so QT interval. Um, greater than 470 is a good cutoff in, 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 uh, among uh, those in the field in recent times and talks that I've heard. Uh, so yeah, if it's if it's a first degree relative, if it truly runs in the family, um, I I think it it could be appropriate to refer to a, a cardiologist, particularly if the issue is sports clearance. Great. Um, have you seen more cardiology referrals since APP guideline for return to sports post COVID infection? 
do you think incidence of cardiac related chest pain is higher in recent years than in the studies discussed? I don't think the incidence of, of cardiac, of uh, chest pain is any higher. I, I've showed you those articles, which you know, uh, are pretty consistent um, in evaluating the thousands of patients that the incidence of, of heart disease you know, certainly remains low and that there isn't, um, over those studies, there didn't seem to be much change, but rather concurrence. Uh, with respect to COVID and uh, and, 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 and uh, cardiac disease or impairment. Again, that, that's another talk. Um, first of all, uh, I, chest discomfort isn't going to be the issue in those, in those uh, patients in the, uh, in the same way. There, there are the two, um, a, a couple of different settings. Um, for um, in early on in COVID, for, there were kids who were hospitalized with acute illness. It was a um, multi-system uh, disease, it was called MIS-C, where the, where the heart was involved with this pericarditis and myocarditis as part of an acute illness. And symptoms or findings were that of heart dysfunction, ventricular dysfunction. Uh, there were instances of pericarditis and myocarditis that were associated with vaccination um, that uh, got some, some news, particularly with those who were worried about the dangers of, of, uh, of vaccination. Um, and with pericarditis, certainly there could be chest discomfort. And again, remember pericarditis among the cardiac causes in the chest pain populations um, <clears throat> uh, was, was most common. So, so if there was a a recent vac vaccination uh, or, or COVID infection, one can, again, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the clinical setting. Um, uh, of those who have cardiac involvement with COVID, the data is right now that that resolves. Maybe down the road, we'll find out that there are late complications or findings that occur all the time. But certainly for those who would have pericarditis and myocarditis with vaccinations, that, that, that went away. It was mostly um, teenage boys and no one knows why. Um, and, and even when there were such occurrences, uh, clinically it was resolution. Uh, in terms of clearance for sports, after someone has had COVID, I, mean, I think there was much more concern with that early on when, when cardiac involvement with severe illness um, uh, uh, did occur. If someone was really sick with COVID, particularly if it required hospitalization, <laughs> then uh, return to uh, physical activity and sports, the recommendations are just do it gradually over, over time, wait until um, symptoms and illness is completely resolved and returned to activity should be uh, should be gradual. Um, uh, over what period of time? I, th I think what I've read is all empirical or consensus uh, rather than based on any studies. Uh, are they more likely if they once they become fully active, say as endurance athletes after being sick with COVID, do they have any more likely occurrence of uh, of heart abnormalities after that time? I haven't seen anything, any series or anything. In in the literature. So I, I think it's just clinical judgment that the returns activity is gradual and progressive. I don't see any questions right now, but we'll still pause. If you, if you have any more questions, please feel free to uh, submit them. If you, like me, always think of a great question after the session, remember you can always log into the VC platform and ask Dr. Engoff, uh, you know, your question, your consult after the session or to any of our Maven Project volunteers. And just another note, I know um, some people like to share computers. Zoom only recognizes the person who has attended. So the slide deck in the CME survey will only send to the person who is on the Zoom account. Uh, to rectify this, you can either log into your own account to sign in, or if you send me an email with the, just your name and your email address and what session you attended, I can make sure that you get all of that information.
I've, I've, I've since if there are, are, are any other questions, I'll answer them. But I'll, I'll ask a question. Great. Of those, those attendees. Um, what I've presented, does it make sense or to ask this question? Is, is this, do you think this will help you in how you evaluate children who appear in your clinic with chest pain? So the first, do you think it'll help? Uh, comment says, absolutely. <clears throat> um, yes. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> okay. And <clears throat> um, the, um, the second question is, um, um, is it different from the way you've been treating or, or considering young people with chest pain in the past? Yes, if, 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 this is, if this will change your practice from the past in terms of whether you would refer to tests uh, raise concerns. Some, yes. some, uh, this says, yes, it will change my practice. Not a big change in practice, but provides more confidence in decision making. Okay. Well, those, those are, those are my goals is to, is to help you be more, more effective and more, and, and more confident and more comfortable. Um, this comment, it just says this, this does make sense. I usually find chest wall tenderness. I still end up sending quite a few patients for cardiology eval for sports uh, pre-participation exams if there's questions. Okay. Uh, yes, good examination um, to find ch uh, um, chest uh, tenderness, recreating the symptom it should give a great sense of relief and will also make it easier to reassure, reassure both your patients and their families. And this is also another reassurance. It says, yes, it makes sense. All of chest pain I have seen thus far in practice has been GERD, costochondritis, or anxiety, but there's always the lingering worry I'm missing something. Glad to be reassured I'm probably not. I think that's, a, that's an accurate statement. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in. Dr. Engoff, thank you so much. This was wonderful and really a great Q&A session. I really, really enjoyed that. So thank you. Um, we have a few thank yous coming in. So again, thank you so much for today and thank you all for uh, attending. Well, thank you everybody for your, your uh, attention and consideration. All right. Have a great day.